Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 14th of August. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by the Citizens Party Victoria State Chairman and Researcher Jeremy Beck. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, bail-in and war. Who is dictating to Australians? And the power that can save the economy. So first, bail-in and war. Who is dictating to Australians? Now, Jeremy, there's a couple of subjects we're going to cover in this segment um, because they're both extremely relevant to this. That's why I put lump bail-in and war together. And the first is, the other day, Tuesday night, I got to debate on Martin North's channel, um, a, an associate professor at the University of Sydney, Salvatore Barbonis. And the discussion was about China. Um, and, of course, uh, Salvatore had the, the gravity of public opinion on his side and I was swimming against the stream, which I'm happy to do. It's one of the reasons we're being outspoken uh, on this. But Salvatore is an American in Australia, and um, he made it clear on whose behalf... I mean, he, he tried to say this is not about America, but he certainly presented the American point of view in that show. Now, I didn't want to really want to make it about America either, but I would, I would go so far as to say that he didn't really present the American point of view, he's presented a very narrow, neoconservative point of view that's, power, that's, that's very dominant in America now, especially around the, the people that um, work for Trump in the White House. It's also dominant in the United, case, the, the United Kingdom at the moment, among their intelligence establishment there, um, and outfits like the Henry Jackson Society, which is a real hardcore neocon outfit in the United Kingdom. That's very influential with, with Andrew Hastie, the Member of, of Parliament in Australia, who's the most outspoken on China. Um, and, it's out, and, it's, and it's very dominant among that similar faction here in Australia. Right? So that's who he was speaking for. And I, I, I actually want to make that clear. It's not just, it would be wrong and too glib to say he, he, he um, represented America. Um, but speaking for that faction, those people are dictating to Australia. And people have to... I want to raise this because Australians have to understand where they're coming from. They are gunning for war. Now, they, they may actually think that um, they don't want an actual war. They just want everything to be on the edge of war because that both serves their military machine, right? They can make a lot of money out of that. But also, they think that strategically they can contain China. The problem with that kind of calculation is... It can, it can quickly become a miscalculation, right? And the assumption, the assumption that a country like China will back down um, can blow up in their face and it can actually become a war. And, and that would be a disaster for the world. Comparing China to Nazi Germany is the extreme end of this neocon you know, think tanks. Pushing that line is extremely dangerous. You know, as you say, any miscalculation, uh, you know, all these warships in the South China Sea Anything yep. could go wrong. No, of course. And I, I, I agree with you. The comparison of China to Nazi Germany, to me, takes the cake. Uh, and I want to make this point because a lot of people might weigh in and say, oh, well, uh, aren't they? Well, learn a bit of history. The Chinese lost 20 million people fighting the Japanese, who were the Nazis' allies in World War II. It's a total insult. And it was communists and nationalists in China fighting. This is before the, the communist revolution, but the communists fought them too, right? And also, let me remind people that the reason the Nazis came to power with a systemic, systematic genocide machine was because the, the, the German uh, faction that backed the Nazis, including Wall Street and City of London people that actually backed Hitler, they succeeded in demonising the communists then as this great threat, which justified the rise of Hitler and fascism to combat communism, right? And it's the people that are telling you now that the communists are the threat again, even though China is hardly communist at all in terms of the way its economy works. Um, I would argue they're behaving more like the Nazis because they're the ones that are going to lead us um, into war. Some of the things that, that we were being told in that debate to believe in Australia is he was an... Amer this, is, this, this got my goat. I didn't want to make it about Salvatore personally, but he's an American. And he, he basically said, even though without any self-consciousness whatsoever of being an American in Australia, he said, you Australians should be suspicious of Chinese people in Australia. Well, um, 
because he's so clearly identified and, 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 and is in favour of the America that, 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 that along with Britain and Australia has gone and caused untold damage in the Middle East and North Africa through wars, killing millions of people. Um, to be honest, I'm much more suspicious of, of that sort of thinking in Australia. And it is just completely unjustified for the Chinese community of Australia to be, to be um, uh, objects of suspicion, this kind of McCarthyite suspicion that, that's a hangover from the Cold War. But, but that's what he was expecting us to do. He also said Australians must choose between China and the United States. And I'll tell you what's most interesting about that. China is not saying that to us. China is saying just, just stop so obviously being a mouthpiece for the United States. You act independently, let's do business together. That's all China wants to do, right? He's saying, America, he's saying to Australia, you must choose. Right, and th th there is this real um, uh, dictatorial quality to it. We, you, you will lose your security if you don't choose. Um, he also said, just straight out, without compunction, China is evil, absolutely evil. Right, don't even think about it. China's evil. Did he have to prove it? No, I, I, I tried to combat him with facts. He got away with insinuations. Um, what I was probably most dis disappointed or, and, and even disgusted is when he reduced. He, he went through this. He summarised the debate at the end with this Cold War, with this sort of um, summary of, of history since, the, since World War II, right? And he talks about how Americans are proud of their foreign policy and their role in World War II, and they should be. But then he lumped it all in together as if it was all the same thing. And he glossed over big chunks of that history, including the Vietnam War, especially the last 20 years of the Iraq War, the Libya disaster, etc. And he reduced that to this term, oh, that's foreign policy adventurism. Well, that adventurism has killed millions and millions of people, especially Muslims, right? And that's why I will not, tol I will not, just not take it from these people who are suddenly telling me that, they, that, 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 that China is evil because they care about supposedly Muslims in Xinjiang in China, right? So anyway, um, uh, the, 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 only, the only other thing I wanted to point out is I, I, I began the debate by quoting John Quincy Adams, one of the early presidents of the United States, who was the son of one of the founding fathers, John Adams, um, not the economist who... Uh, I quote on the show in an interview last year uh, and, and, and a few weeks ago, but the, 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 um, the great American president, so his son was also president, John Quincy Adams. And of course, John Quincy Adams had this quote that, that America goes not forth abroad in search of monsters to destroy. And Salvatore came back to that at the end and said, oh, he was an elitist. Well, um, he was also the president who actually, and uh, when we talk about policies like national banking, he was the president who presided over the second bank of the United States and what was called the internal improvement system that actually made, you know, gave, put into practice what's called the American system of investing in infrastructure and internal improvements and manufacturing, which became noteworthy um, as the source of America's success. And China has adopted a lot of that to this day. Um, and that's why China's successful, not because it's put in place communism, but because it's copied those sort of things. Um, and Americans should be proud of that and look for ways to collaborate and cooperate with that approach rather than um, looking for a war, right? And that's, that's why I think Australia needs to be more independent and actually um, deliver that message to the United States. Um, I'll move on unless you had another, any more comment to make about that, Jeremy? Oh, I think it's very, very clear. I mean, the last thing we need is World War Three. No, absolutely. And, that, and people have to understand, that's, the, the, that's our starting point as a party. It's why we are really convinced of that danger. It's why we look at it that way. We're not, this is, um, if you don't, you may think, where's the Citizens Party coming from? That's where we're coming from, right? That would put every other problem we've got in the shade if that ever happened. We have to stop it. All right, let's get on to bail-in now because we're being dictated to on bail-in as well. And... I want, to, I want to mention someone that regular viewers and long-term viewers would be very familiar with because she's raised her head in the bail-in debate and it's Senator Jane Hume, who we call the Senator for Bankers, um, who now will refer to as Senator Bail-in. And that's what she's identified herself um, as. She was the person who ushered the 2018 law through Parliament, right? She, she chaired the inquiry. She frankly rigged that inquiry. Um, and got the bill, this is a bill they passed through with only 14 senators present, present in 28, sorry, not 14 senators, uh, eight senators present in 2018, didn't even have a formal vote. And I was sitting in the gallery watching this. And in fact, I'd had a meeting with Jane Hume just a few minutes earlier. She's now spoken up. She's, politicians are sending her letters as if she's the authority in parliament on this. 
And she's replying to those letters, no, we do not need this law. And by the law, I mean Senator Malcolm Roberts' law, which would clarify the bill to make sure it can't be used to bail in deposits, right? It's very simple what we're asking to do. The, the, the point is, the inquiry proves there's, there's uncertainty. Malcolm Roberts' bill will remove the uncertainty, right? Because um, there's the words, any other instrument, and it adds to those words in brackets, not including a deposit account, right? And we argue that the words, any other instrument, which is very broad, are very uncertain, and by adding in that clause that's in Malcolm Roberts' bill, not including a deposit account, it makes it very certain, right? That's what we're asking them to do. It doesn't do anything else except that. So she replies, oh, there's already legislative certainty. We don't need that. The bill is unnecessary. There is already legislative certainty. And as I've explained here, that's not, that's not the case. She also says, we're protected by the financial claim scheme, 250,000 deposit guarantee scheme, and the Banking Act's um, deposit of preference. And of course, no, no, no. None of those things actually apply in terms of a bail-in, do they? No, absolutely not. I mean, banks uh, bailed in to stop them from failing. So the, the financial claim scheme would not be put in place at all. It's not even activated. So you lose, not, not your, above your 250000 you lose all of it if that is deemed necessary to save that bank through a bail-in. Exactly. And this is the, so the politicians keep harping on about this, but it's interesting when a politician writes back to you saying, oh, you, don't worry, you're protected by the financial claim scheme. They, they're not actually going to admit this, but what they're, what they're implying by that is, well, if you have more than $250,000 in the bank, what's over $250,000 is not protected. It could be bailed in. Now, they're not going to admit to that, but that's the implication of what they're saying by continually harping on about this cl financial claim scheme, which we're convinced doesn't apply. Um, so... And that itself goes against their, their official line. So we all, all we're asking to do is, is, is put in a reasonable amendment to clarify the law. If the government was genuine in saying deposits won't be bailed in, there's no reason for them not to do that. Right? The fact they're insisting on not doing it, and Jane Hume is now leading that charge inside the government, tells you something. Right? Yeah. That she represents the bankers. Fact, there's a lot of bankers in Parliament, funnily enough. She's the, probably the most active of them. Right? She represents the bankers' faction in, in the parliament, especially in the Liberal Party, and they want this. They do not want the, the law clarified. That tells you something. Um, it, it explains why we're, you know, it, it's explained by the fact we've signed on to this global agenda through the Financial Stability Board. So we put out a press release today. It's on our website um, going after Senator Bailin and the details. We need, you know, keep making those calls to members of parliament and keep demanding they pass this amendment. Right? They've got no reason not to. And when Parliament comes back, there'll be a big argument about that inside there. And um, yeah, use, use uh, what we say about Senator Bailin in that, in that um, press release. So have a look at it. Anyway, let's have a break. When we come back, we're going to change the subject to the power that can save the economy. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Now... The power that can save the economy. Let me assure you, the economy needs saving. We know the problems that the economy is in because of the response to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, as we've said here, those problems were, were already there, right? The pandemic is the one thing, that, the first thing to come along to really show them up. The problem, the biggest problem, the bigger problem we have is not um, the policies right now, it's that what the government is intending to do about the economic problems, which for, um, by all accounts is not very much at all. So for instance, the, the Federal Treasury Secretary, Stephen Kennedy, just the other day warned that the high unemployment we're going to have in Australia is going to last at least five years. I mean, that is crazy. That means we're just going to sit on our hands and just hope the, the, uh, the free market just solves us all for us. And, it's, and it will eventually, but it'll just take a while. And pay we're, workers to stay at home and do nothing. Uh, and, and that's going to get our economy going. Whereas there's so much we could be doing. And we want to talk now, when you want to do things, though, you need power. Mm -hmm. Right? And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about the power that can save the economy is nuclear power. Um, so, Jeremy, back in the 80s, there was a huge fight over nuclear power in Australia. Laws were passed that Australia cannot go nuclear. Cannot actually use, so we supply a lot of the world's uranium, but we can't use it ourselves. There's a really significant sign now of changes in that direction, not just from right-wing types in politics, but also now the unions have weighed in. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you've got uh, two unions uh, who have both in the last few months put out very, very strong statements supporting nuclear power. Uh, you've got the CFM MEU's Victorian division of the, the, the mining and energy division. Uh, and you've got the Australian Workers Union. And both of those have put out some really, really good arguments for nuclear power. I've got uh, uh, Jeff uh, Dyke here, and he's uh, with the uh, CFM MEU. And he says, a just transition of coal-fired power station workers and their communities towards a modern nuclear industry is realistically achievable, whereas the CFM MEU Mining and Energy Division, Victoria, believes a just transition to renewables is not. And, and there's very good reason for that because so-called renewables, you know, solar and wind, they, they sometimes you know, go along nice and when the wind's blowing hard and when, when you don't have any wind and when, when night time or no solar power at all, of course, you can't rely on that for an economy. You need power 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just when the wind's blowing and the sun's shining. And it's very, very obvious that you can put a little bit of renewables into the mix, but as soon as you start getting over a certain percentage, the whole system falls apart. And, and storing it is extremely expensive. Batteries, it would yep. be a hundred times more expensive. And batteries are toxic themselves. Oh yeah, and, and, and all these so-called renewables depend upon fossil fuels. They can't exist without fossil fuels. So of course, for the concern about climate change, um, which is, you know, they, they, they focus all their concerns on carbon dioxide emissions. N nuclear also solves that for them, right? But the, the downside that they people think is, you know, okay, what about the waste? Um, and what about the safety? And of course, on both fronts, it's got much better. Like our, 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 this technology has advanced a lot, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. You, you've got the, the old gen generation reactors that you know, admittedly did have some problems, but you've got to look at it into context. I mean, you had Three Mile Island, you had Chernobyl, you had Fukushima. Overall, if you consider all the people who died from nuclear you know, accidents, they're a tiny, tiny fraction of the people who died in coal mining accidents and died from installing you know, wind turbines or solar cells. People fall off the roofs when they're installing the solar panels. Overall, if you look at the numbers, nuclear power wins hands down in terms of the safety record. But the new reactors are much, much safer. Some of the uh, fourth generation reactors, which will be the ones that they will be building in the coming decades, they're essentially meltdown proof. And, and you know, you've got several different varieties. You've got the gas-cooled ones that are helium-cooled. Uh, you've got the molten salt reactors, uh, which uh, they have a, a drain pipe. So that to, as soon as it starts getting too hot, you don't need any intervention. It just melts a, a plug, yeah. and then the whole thing just drains away safely. So it's, it's meltdown proof. But there's so many different new designs. You're never going to get anything approaching a, a Chernobyl-style uh, crisis. And if we went in this direction, we, don't, we can also um, start exploiting really exciting possibilities such as thorium. Mm -hmm. Thorium, you can use the entire fuel and as much more of it. It uh, also has the uh, advantage that it can't be uh, very easily produced uh, into weapons-grade uh, you know, materials. So that, that has that huge advantage there. Look, uh, there, there's so much uranium and thorium combined that we'll never run out of fuel, particularly the breeder reactors, we'll never run out of nuclear fuel. That's and right. then there's other fuels again when you move on to fusion. You, well, you won't run out of energy and it'll be cheap. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about fusion. Welcome back to The Citizen's Report, where we're discussing the power that can save the economy, which is nuclear. Before the break, we talked about various types of, of uh, fission nuclear, and then Jeremy mentioned fusion, and that's what we're going to talk about now, because of course fusion, if it's achieved, can, takes us way beyond anything that we've ever imagined. Um, and Jeremy, there has, there's some breakthroughs in that area. Yes, uh, well there's the uh, ITER, but also uh, I've read an article which I covered a very interesting topic on the hydrogen boron fusion. Uh, and this has been known about, this. it's not something new, but physicists have known for a long time the reaction between hydrogen and boron can produce enormous amounts of energy, but you need an intense conditions to make that happen. And up until now, you haven't had, uh, you know, it's not been thought possible to do it because you need such high temperatures uh, that, you know, where we thought, how, how could we achieve that? 
But there's been some massive breakthroughs in laser technologies. Uh, and these laser technologies have, have the ability to focus an enormous amount of energy in that laser beam at a very, very tiny fraction of a second. I mean, we're, we're talking about, they call them femtoseconds. Uh, a, a few femtoseconds uh, is, uh, one femtosecond is equal to one million billionth of a second. <laughs> so this is incredible. And they use these lasers which are equivalent to about 100 times the power of all the, the power plants on all of Earth for that tiny, tiny fraction of a second. And you, you have this enormous amount of power of, of um, yeah, literally a million billion watts. So is the goal to make that, that amount of time longer? Yeah, well, the, the, no, the, the goal is to just inject an enormous amount of energy in a tiny, tiny amount of time to get the boron uh, and, oh. and the hydrogen fusion happening. Right, and then right. un under those conditions, those in really intense conditions, yep. well then, then you can get that new or fusion reaction happening. And it produces a lot more energy than fission, right? Oh, well, fusion does, full stop. So, yeah. so th this is quite an exciting uh, breakthrough that is happening in the laser technologies which will allow the fusion to go ahead. So you just explain the ITER project though in France, what's going on there? Well, that, that's a, a collaboration with uh, several nations. You've got uh, Russia, you've got United States, uh, you've got France. Well, it's actually in France. Uh, so you, you've got this uh, <clears throat> tokamak reactor, which is, uh, uses uh, this magnetic field to hold all the, uh, the, the plasma all together and increase the heat to enormous temperatures to get the fusion. And, and you have to put a certain amount of energy in, but the design of this this ITR reactor is that you, you'll put in 50 megawatts of energy, but you'll get 500 megawatts out. So, you know, that, that's that's amazing breakthrough to, to get a, that positive energy back. And that's and, under construction now. And that is, and well, they've just started the assembly phase. And then we'll move on uh, to using that for the research and development uh, to make some further discoveries in fusion. Now, I just want to make a quick comparison though, because um, we're, we're, we're promoting the nuclear option. There's a, there's a, when, when, when people talk about the green revolution or the green new deal, they promise it comes with lots of jobs because there are lots of jobs building, you know, solar, solar farms and, and all this kind of thing. Um, why, why is that, why is the jobs building energy plants not the objective that we should be looking for? Well, I think that the main point is uh, it would be best to have fewer jobs to produce the set number of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours of electricity so that we could deploy those people elsewhere in the economy to do more useful things and that would make power cheaper. So I mean, you, sure you can create more jobs, you could employ people uh, digging holes and filling them back in again and that's going to create a lot of jobs. What's it going to do? So what do we want to do? What's the objective? We want to produce electricity. We want to produce a certain megawatts of electricity, megawatt hours of electricity. Well, it would be better to do that with fewer jobs. Because then, with the cheapest possible electricity, you can do a lot of things with that electricity. That's where the job oh, yeah. should be. Yep. Um, and I think there's a debate about that, but, but generally, where we're going is nuclear energy is becoming cheapest. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you, you've had this quote from the Australian Workers Union, uh, and they said in their submission, the cost of energy from advanced nuclear technologies in Australia is set to be cheaper than all renewable technologies and gas powered generators and in many cases also cheaper than coal. Well, there you go, and that's quite significant. So we need, we're highlighting this because these are the sort of things we need to be investing in and we can invest in it with our other policy of a national development bank. We need to be thinking big about getting Australia going as an economy, doing real things, right? So anyway, we're out of time. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today on the Citizens Report. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more.